Welcome back. This is Aman Chauhan, um, and I'm here back with Carcinoid Cancer Foundation as the Net Experts uh, series of questions. We continue to get a lot of really interesting questions from neuronic tumor patient community from all over the world. And in this part two of the video, I will go over some of these interesting questions. All right, so first up, somebody asked me, what would be the best treatment for someone who had to stop octreotide or landriotide uh, for side effects? Uh, looks like patient has history of metastatic mid-gut neuroendocrine tumor, hasn't had surgery, and also suffers from carcinoid syndrome. Fortunately, landriotide and sandostatin are both very well tolerated uh, treatments in our mid-gut or metastatic neuronic tumor patient population. But very rarely, we do come across that some patients are unable to tolerate sandostatin landriotide. In event uh, of uh, uh, side effects, and we have to discontinue treatments for side effects, there are fortunately a lot of other options these days for our metastatic gastroenteropancreatic neuronic tumor patients. Some of them might include PRRT, mTOR inhibitor Evrolimus, uh, and also various clinical trials uh, investigating novel agents like um, cabozantinib. Um, very recently, surfatinib was under investigation. So there are a lot of treatment options that the, the patient should discuss uh, appropriate option uh, for the relevant patient. Having said that, there is also another very interesting and useful agent called Zermelo or teletrostat ethyl, which is FDA approved for carcinoid syndrome diarrhea refractory to somatostatin analog. So if this particular patient is suffering from carcinoid syndrome diarrhea, Zermelo would be a very, very useful uh, treatment option for management of carcinoid syndrome diarrhea. Uh, lastly, the patient did mention that hasn't had any surgical debulking. Now, role of surgical resection in metastatic disease for disease control per se is uh, controversial and debated. Uh, there are pros and cons. However, there is uh, definitely a role for surgical cytoreduction in functional neuronic tumor patients. At the end of day, the, one of the goals uh, in the management of uh, functional net patients is to shrink the tumor or cytoreduce the tumor so that less amount of vasoactive peptide or hormone is secreted. And we try to do that with the help of medications and sometimes uh, with the help of surgery or local regional therapy like uh, embolization. So surgical cytoreduction should be evaluated and that's why it is very critical for patients to uh, seek a second opinion, go to a NETS uh, center of excellence and have a case reviewed by a multidisciplinary tumor board, which includes surgeons, interventional radiologists, medical oncologists, and various other subspecialists. All right, moving on. Uh, I had a neuronic tumor removed from the right occipital area of my scalp in 2019. I've been under care of local oncologists, and unfortunately, the cancer re relapsed or uh, the tumor um, came back beneath the incision of the scar. I'm going to be able to see an oncologist for a second opinion. My question is, are you familiar with this type of cancer on scalp? Neuroendocrine tumors can originate anywhere in the body. Although the three commonest location are uh, mid-gut or small intestines, pancreas and lung, but it is not unusual for us to see neuronic tumor at various other organs, including skin. I personally have seen neuronic tumor in skin. Uh, in this particular scenario, the two things that I would like to investigate is, is this primary cutaneous neuronic tumor? That means did the neuronic tumor originate in the scalp or was scalp a metastatic site? Because sometimes a metastatic lesion can also uh, or, or uh, present or manifest in the skin or subcutaneous tissue. The other thing that I would like to investigate is what type of neurologic tumor or cancer this is. Is this well-differentiated 
uh, low grade in NET or is it a high grade poorly deficient in NEC? Uh, a type of neuronicin cancer or high grade variety called Merkel cell carcinoma, which is a very distinct disease in itself, uh, tends to uh, occur in the skin or subcutaneous tissue. So it would be very important to have a correct histopathological diagnosis um, before recommending further treatment, but very good question. And lastly, is there an evidence or uh, based on research into linking of two different type of nets apart from MEN1, which is a well-known phenomena, specifically carcinoid tumor of lung and Merkel cell carcinoma. I had uh, these diagnoses within 12 months of each other. Uh, certainly, this is a very unique situation um, to get diagnosed with two very rare cancer, one being Merkel cell carcinoma and the other lung carcinoid, and that too in such a short time frame within a year. To my knowledge, there are no known uh, genetic syndrome which links or ties together Merkel cell carcinoma and low-grade well deficient NET like carcinoid. However, uh, it might be worthwhile uh, uh, getting a genetic counseling and uh, maybe considering genetic testing, considering it's a very rare situation. Could, it could be very well a coincidence. Um, my very good friend, Dr. Heidi Del Rivero is studying natural history of these rare cancers and they do have access to routine uh, somatic uh, tumor mutation analysis as well as germline testing. Uh, so that would be another option uh, for patients to get a second opinion at NIH and get uh, genetic testing done. Again, there is no known uh, link or correlation as of now. Um, but uh, might be worth looking into genetic counseling and testing. Um, this was it for this segment. Uh, we will meet again. We have a lot more very interesting questions. And again, uh, uh, thank you so much Carcinoid Cancer Foundation for giving us this platform to discuss these patient uh, questions. Thank you.